in the hustle of life, with all its noise and busyness, it's important to take time to be still, to calm our senses, to renew our bodies, and to open our minds. In this holy space of peace, we call forth the names of those for whom we pray, believing that they are cared for and cared about by a loving creator. They are heard, they are blessed, they are loved. A deeper peace calls us as our worldly concerns are set aside and we enter the eternal moment that is beyond our human understanding and experience. God is a gracious God, ever expanding, ever renewing, ever loving all of creation. The real challenge of our spiritual journey is to love ourselves enough to be open to the unending gift of God's graciousness. Oftentimes we are far more critical of ourselves than we are of others. We judge, we condemn, we berate ourselves. We would never speak to a dear friend or a loved one with the violent energy our words often hold when we're speaking to ourselves. And thus we plant seeds of this ongoing downward dialogue that not only interferes with our life, but the gift of love from others. It is time to breathe into the grace of God, the healer, the salve, the liquid that quenches the heat of fire within us. Let us be still in this eternal moment to receive the gift of soothing love our hearts so long for. May we know the cooling breeze of peace within our hearts and an acceptance of the life we live, the person we are, ever growing in greater understanding of our God realization and connection. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. <clears throat> to share with you a poem by a gentleman by the name of Edgar Guest. Edgar Guest was a very, very prolific poet. He lived from 1891 to 1959. He was born in England, but in his early youth, uh, his parents came to, in uh, excuse me, to the United States, and he lived in Detroit the rest of his life. His poetry was very well known in the early part of the 20th century because it was published in almost every daily newspaper in the United States. Now, in today's world, he's a little bit sing-song. He has a, the rhyming cadence, which I particularly kind of like. Um, but also his poetry is about the ordinary, about the every man, if you will. So one of the poems that has always really spoken to me is what I'd like to read to you now. It's called Sermons We See. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes of better pupil and are willing and more willing than the ear. Find counsel is confusing, but example always is clear. 
And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in actions, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be wise and true, but I'd rather let some lesson by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. There's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. The other day as I was driving home, one of the... um, local churches had a sign on its bulletin board and it says the way you live your life is the sermon that you preach you know i hadn't thought of edgar guest home in a long long time and when i saw that billboard i thought oh what is you know how you do what is that poem i remember it and so dug around to find it but i thought that that really speaks to me one of the things i've learned over the years in ministry is When I was in active ministry, I used to preach almost every Sunday, and I loved the idea of having a theme, and then it would unpack itself through the three or four Sundays that I would be speaking. So last Sunday, we talked about this groundlessness, this space in between, and I thought it was so interesting because all week long, Spirit must have known I was going to fill in for Sandra because I kept seeing these signs. I found that poem and all different ways and shapes and connections to this questioning and a deeper um, understanding and a pursuing of what this groundlessness is all about. So I think that oftentimes we as ministers tend to prepare sermons that have some research, that have some uh, past experience, but that are already what I'm going to call processed. This event happened to me. I This is what I learned from it. This is what I want to share with you. But seldom do I feel, and, and I'm speaking about myself, do I invite you into my own process where I have a smattering of unfolding revelation But I can't say that it all really makes sense because that's the way we spiritually grow. We said God is a revelatory God. Therefore, in each moment, in each breath, driving down the street, taking a shower, uh, feeding the, the bird, whatever it might be that's part of my life experience are all moments where the revelation of God reveals itself if I'm open, receptive, and aware to the God moment. So I thought a lot about this groundlessness, what we call the space in between. So in other words, we were talking about the scriptural passage that said, with God, all things are possible. Yes, and it and it's out of this center point that our understanding and new possibilities come the challenge, one of the challenges we have is that when we say, um, with God, all things are possible, we say, this is what I want. Hello, God, this is what I want. Pay attention here. Or we say, this is what I don't want. Pay attention to this too, God. But seldom do we encounter the middle space, the space that's in between, the space that is all possibility, pure potential, eternally full and alive. But What struck me this week as that last week's sermon sort of played with me is that when something happens to us that seems to us as out of all possibilities, some event, a new job, a love interest, uh, uh, something happens, we tend to think of it as being a miracle And yet it's really not because whatever happens to us is always congruent with who we are. Now, this really fascinated me because I thought, well, now, wait a minute. Um, Whenever I've had a moment in my life, an inspiration, an insight, something happened, good, bad, it was always 
in the same vein as my gifts, my talents, my time in life, where I live, my upbringing, all of that. It's not out of context to who and what I am, what I believe, what I teach. So this has led me down kind of a, a rabbit hole of trying to understand what is in this space in between. This fertile ground where all things are possible is not barren. That's interesting to me. Let me give you an example. I retired from pulpit ministry, from active pulpit ministry in May of 2020. And for the next year and a, year and a half, I was just, I had all my projects. Marianne is all about projects. She's got all her projects working on and doing stuff. And I was so excited and just happy as a clam to be retired and do my thing. But June of 2021, I started feeling that heaviness, just kind of a little bit of depression, not really feeling good, not really feeling bad, no purpose, no drive. What was the reason for getting up in the morning? My dear, sweet friend, Janet Meshke, and I were talking, and she said, Marianne, why don't you come to Brownsville on Zoom? You don't have to get out. You can just stay at your home. And join us on Zoom. Okay. So I did. And for the first couple of weeks, I enjoyed the service on Zoom, was getting to know people on Zoom, and that was a lot of fun. And then as the summer wore on, the conversation about becoming a minister of record, which is quite new in unity. So we really didn't even know what we were talking about, but there was this possibility of becoming minister of record at Unity of Brownsville. You see, friends, Brownsville, you, Brownsville, did not offer me a job and say, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Marianne. We have a sister church in Uganda, and we're going to send you to mission work out in the field in Uganda. Because it is not congruent with who I am. I sincerely believe. I have always taught and I feel the passion on my heart. For me, as a minister, my message is for the well-educated and the wealthy. Because I believe they are the most spiritually impoverished people. So to send me out to the wilderness of Uganda would not be in alignment, would not be congruent with what I have always felt my spiritual message was at the core of my spiritual message and how I lived my life and how I preached it to the world. And I and it, it got me to really thinking that, you know, so often when things have happened, which would I, I would say out of all possibilities God has presented me with, fill in the blank, I have realized that they are they may be uncomfortable at first because they're different. It's change. But in the end, when I can look back and refer back, I go, you know what? That was a natural unfolding of my life all along. And why is that? Because the field of all possibility is not empty. I love that. The field is not empty because we are constantly planting seeds. So, for example, we plant thought seeds. We have hopes and dreams and aspirations. We plant emotional seeds. We love, we fear. We plant physical seeds about our own physiology, but as well as the physical space in which we inhabit in the world. We plant these seeds in the field. And then they grow. You know, it's interesting. If you use the analogy of a farmer, for example, so he harvests the, the crop. He does not go back and vacuum each row to get all the extra seeds that have fallen off the truck during the harvest process. When you exhale, you don't exhale every single molecule of air that you inhaled. When your your body, when your when your heart beats, not every little molecule of blood goes out 
that came in. So there's always something in the field of possibilities that is at any one point in time in any level of manifestation. So I remember when when I was a kid, my grandfather, he used to, um, he, he was a displaced farmer into the city. And so for years, he would have, you go into his garage, you never had a car, but in the garage were those Maxwell House coffee cans, remember those? And on the right-hand side would be all the bulbs, the, the tulips and the daffodils and the freesias and the irises that he would plant in the fall for blossoming in the spring. And on the left-hand side were the tomatoes and the corn and all the vegetables that in the spring he would plant for the crop that would be coming up. And I thought, that's exactly what it is when we talk about this place of pure possibility. There's like Maxwell House cans of our thoughts and our words and our deeds that are seeds that are actually growing at various and sundry rates and times. What would my grandfather do with those seeds? I mean, let's face it, during the winter, and Ohio winters were pretty strong, he would nurture those seeds, wouldn't he? He would make sure there was some light on in the garage. He would go out and water them. He would put some uh, stuff to protect it from the bitter wind that would come around. So slowly but surely, he would nurture the seed to protect it so that when it was time to plant, he could do that. So my question then becomes, how do we, how do I nurture, if grandpa would water them and, and give them light, how do I nurture the seed thoughts? How do I nurture the emotion thoughts? How do I nurture the physical thoughts? Do I nurture them from the higher point of view or do I just relive those same things over and over and over again? So that when I feel down and depressed, I just continue to nurture the seed of down and depressed. And the harvest can only be one thing. What does the seed yield is what the seed is. But here's what I discovered that I thought was so fascinating. When we struggle with a seed, let me give you an example. Say we are having a very difficult relationship with our daughter-in-law. And we really, really are struggling to not just make do or to play nice, but we're really struggling to love this person. We don't understand why the conflict, we're trying to look deep within ourselves to, get, to be authentic to who and what we are. And we begin to, to love where we haven't loved before. Now, please hear me when I'm talking about this. I'm not saying that magically we click our heels and say we're in Kansas and all of a sudden everything is fine. No. But remember what we talked about last week is loving transformation. When I struggle to love, in a situation or a person that doesn't seem lovable to me, grace comes in and mutates that difficulty, that negative seed, if you will, because I've been feeding the seed of, oh, she's, uh, you know, I don't like this person. Grace comes in when we love onto this seed and suddenly we have a new seed planted. And the other day I was reading this, blew me away. They were saying that neuroscience now tells us that when we love, when we strive to love, especially in difficult situations, we begin to create new neural pathways. I love this science stuff. New neural pathways in the brain that override the reptilian brain. Remember we talked about the, the reptilian brain, just a short definition is our fight and flight. And so when we're in difficult situations, what we want to do is fight or we want to fly, okay, to protect ourselves. 
But the reptilian brain doesn't work for us anymore, but it's still working. But when, as we continue to strive for love in unloving places and things and events and relationships in our life, we are building new neural pathways that will come together. And we talk about the third eye as being the site of our intuitive wisdom that eventually makes us kinder, more compassionate, more loving people. What a win! Trifecta! We become more insightful, we become more wise, and we become more loving and compassionate to ourselves, to the world. That really struck me. What is being planted in this field of all possibility? It is not a void. It is not a vacuum. There's something happening through the seeds that I have planted, the seeds that you have planted, that I am nurturing and nourishing and maturing to come to fruition at a moment when I may, when I pray for X, whatever X might be, a new job, a new relationship, a new that can I come from a place of a more loving seed. You know, in, in the world of agriculture, they call that a hybrid, a hybrid seed, right? It is more tolerant to uh, against disease and it yields more. What a great analogy. It's more tolerant to disease. So our own physiology is improved and it yields more. I'd like a little more love and a little more wisdom in my life, wouldn't you? That That is just, that is really exciting to me. Then I was reading, now see, like I said, all week long, these smatterings were coming up. So I guess I kind of knew I was going to preach the sermon anyway. Werner Herzog said, if you harshly light every last corner of your house, it the house will become uninhabitable. That's interesting. If you harshly light everything in your house, you can't say it's, it's like so turn that light off. Right. And he goes on to say, it's like that with your soul. If you light it all up, shades and darkness and all people will become uninhabitable people will become uninhabitable because you know it's the basic rule of photography that they teach us you have to have contrast your camera why does it automatically focus it doesn't focus on who you're focusing on it focuses on the line between the light and the dark on the contrast so you and I, we need the darkness. We need the times of our shadows. We need the, the journey to go into the field that is not fallow, that we're planting seeds and look around at those seeds and say, how can I love more? You see, unfortunately, what we do, speaking of myself, I see this event or this person or this thing as a failure. You know, and Charles Fillmore told us, he said, there is no chapter in our life that is such a great failure that in back of it isn't the purpose of your life unfolding. And it will unfold in an ennobling manner. I love that quote. No purpose in your life. You call it a failure. You label it something bad. Or the world labels it, oh, well, you didn't succeed at that job or whatever. But if you can love that seed, it becomes a hybrid to nurture the next journey of your life, the next chapter as you turn the page of your life. So I'm going to ask you a question. What is the sermon that your life would preach if you had to give? today's talk. Thank you and God bless.